Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Gregory Mele. I am the head instructor and founder of Chicago Stroke Play Guild. I'm here with one of my senior students, Aaron Fitzgerald. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, Tony invited us back. We had the privilege last year of doing a couple of demos for you guys, uh, one on medieval swordsmanship and another on Renaissance swordsmanship. Uh, these are, as you might gather by how we're dressed, our areas of expertise in Chicago Sword Play Guild. We have been, since 1999, researching and recreating the historical martial arts of Italy from about 1350 to 1650. And in case you're wondering how do you even do that, the way we do it is through the uh, there are a number of surviving manuscripts uh, that are, I don't want to quite call them how-to manuals, but they're technical manuals on various martial arts of Europe with everything you can think of from the nation martial art, wrestling, striking, knife fighting, sword fighting, using spears, fighting on horseback. And then one of those things, and one of the most unique is armored combat. So when we talk about all the other programs, uh, Tony, it's a really about time you guys come and do something in armor. Obviously, we were planning this whole idea in the pre-COVID world, and then it all got a little bit dicey. So fortunately, thanks to the magic of Zoom, uh, Aaron and I, who, to be clear, are in a little, little uh, pandemic bubble together, uh, are able to give you a little insight into armored combat. So what we're going to talk about tonight is essentially how the gentleman, circa about 1410, goes from this to what you're going to see when Aaron's all done, which is the fully armed knight that we've come to think about. So a little bit about what tonight's program will be. We're going to show you how the armor goes on. There's a lot of myths about armor, uh, largely because most people's experience, and I'm just going to make an educated guess, that if you're watching this, you probably have not fought in a full suit of medieval armor. So most people's experience of armor comes from one of three things. Seeing it behind a glass case in the museum, seeing people wearing some kind of replica armor at the Renaissance Fair or reenactment in which you're a spectator, or movies. And other than the first one, you don't really get any reliable data, right? The Ren Fair and the movie's job is to entertain, not necessarily to be accurate. And consequently, um, there's a lot of misconceptions. The first being that, oh my God, it's so heavy. And, you know, for example, it was long believed that you could not get a knight onto a horse except using a waist. Not sure. uh, a knight can vault into their cell, right? Or that if they fell down, they can't get up. Not sure. They can absolutely get back up. So the harness that uh, a knight wears, and the, the time period that we focus on here is the early 15th century which is right about the time that the knight is wearing full plate armor from head to toe. So Aaron will have a full suit of plate armor on. More pieces will grow up over the next 150 years before you start to see a decline in armor. Um, but this is a full suit of armor. And the weight of it is, I don't know, for me, my full harness weighs about 65 pounds. Aaron, what's yours? A little bit less. Right, well, yeah, about 50, right, or so. And there's a foot of, almost a foot of height difference between us. So that sounds horrifically heavy until you consider that, you know, a modern firefighter is wearing about two thirds of that every time they go into a fire. A modern Marine is wearing all of that and more. They can carry, they have a payload anywhere from, you know, 50 to 80 pounds, depending on their specialty. And a lot of us run on the back. So what we see is that fighting men through history seem to carry about can carry around 60 pounds of uh, gear and be combat effective. So that's the first thing I want you to understand is we put this on and Aaron will move around once again and, and show you a little bit. But that this stuff has to work to be of any use. And by work, we need to get to be able to actually move it. So we'll talk about movement and then we'll talk about the other big thing, which is seeing out of it. And we'll talk about why you almost never see people wear helmets in movies. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So if I were to tell you that the most important thing to know about a suit of armor, if you were going to get a suit of armor, is clothing, you would think I was crazy, right? You'd be like, well, I, uh, I just put on some clothes and I put on armor. Absolutely not. So the trick with armor is you're making an exoskeleton for someone who is, right, an endoskeleton. So you have an internal uh, skeleton, 
and now we want to put a hard shell on top of us. So that hard shell has to move like we do. And so the trick is not only making the metal pieces move in the right way, but making them uh, coming up with a suspension system so they don't slide around. So that's why Erin, you can come up to the front here, and she's going to walk forward. She's wearing what we call an arming coat. I'm going to bring her forward because it's black and you can't always see this. But this is basically cut a lot like the doublet that I'm wearing. Whereas this is a lovely brocade, this is a heavy linen. Okay? But what you'll notice is it's tightly laced up the front, okay? and, that is, and it has to be tight so that the fabric can't twist. You'll notice if I try to tug it around her waist, nothing happens. And then it has these points, right? These cords with these little metal tips, we call those aglets. And these are called arming points or lacing points. And these are the things that the armor itself will attach to, all right? So before you can do anything, this is the garment that you need. And that's because that will keep the armor from rotating or twisting. Okay, so we're going to back up back in the camera, and then we're going to talk about the pieces as we go. So I had Aaron put on a couple of the Dean uh, neck pieces to start with. And the first, very first thing is one of my favorite pieces. It's called a sabaton, or sometimes a solaret. It is a metal shoe. And you can see right here, there's a little lace sticking out. That's because she's wearing uh, one of these soft leather pointed toed shoes, and it literally has a hole in the toe. And the, the sabaton just laces to the points of the shoe. And it then buckles and closes in the back. And you can see it has another lacing point here. So, by the way, just to tell you know that Erin has kind of state of the art post 1400 armor is that her sabaton actually protects the back of the heel. This was a new invention right around the turn of the 15th century. Prior to that, usually the very back of the heel is open making it a little susceptible when you're sitting on a horse with somebody cutting the leg. Okay. Now, the next thing is the greaves. This is probably the hardest piece of armor to make. People always assume it'll be the helmet or maybe the gauntlets. They can both be very tricky and they're both very expensive. But the most expensive piece of armor and the hardest to make are the greaves because they are one size fits one. So they have to be made exactly to your shape. And that's one of the interesting things if you look at mass battle grade finds. One thing that is often right left behind are pieces of light armor. And why? Because they can't, you can't scavenge them. So if you find greaves, and usually greaves, a full greave like this goes to some of the knightly status. So it would be passed on. But in cases where we have knights who kill the battle, um, Light harness like this. Simple greaves may be taken. More complex ones, even though they're better, may not be. And if they were, they were scavenged and brought to be sold uh, for their value. Because again, I can't run that. And just a little bit of difference, she can't either. And so the reason it's so tricky, it has to fit very close to the cap so it can slide up, but not all the way up on her knee. And more importantly, it won't drop too low. So she doesn't want this just grinding against top of the sabaton. She wants to sit right up on her ankle bone. And you can't see with the camera resolution, but even the little curve of the bones in the ankle have been rendered in the steel. Okay? Now one last thing I want to show you, she shows you the inside of the cap. You shall notice that this is where the buckles go. Okay, the buckles on the arm are going inside the pieces. Why? Because straps are a weakness in the armor. I start whipping these straps out, say with my dagger, and this armor starts to flop, starts to slide, it starts to become a liability rather than a benefit. So you want to put them someplace where they can't be gotten at. Again, that's going to be true for everybody on foot or on horse, but especially for a knight, what's a knight's first job? To ride on a horse. So if Aaron is sitting on a horse, there's no way to get him. Okay. So let's start getting her kit up. So the trick with armor is you want to work from the feet so, once we've got those on, the next thing that we're going to take a look at is the cuisse. Now, the cuisse is this thigh plate, as well as this articulated knee, and then it has a little piece down here that we call a demi grief. And the demi grief just means, right, a little partial grief. And the idea is that it comes down and overlaps with the grief to, to close any piece. So, if you don't want this to ride too high to the knee, or it'll rub the hell out of her knee. 
So instead, you make it shorter, and then this piece comes down over the top of the text. And then there's three bottles. Okay? There's one that goes right across the back of the knee. Usually, you want to keep anything that's in the back of the joint fairly loose so that you don't cut off blood flow. Then, there's a staple built into her grief that I pass the strap, excuse me, the strap through so that this can't slide. And that'll keep that demi grief married to the actual grief itself. And then finally, there's a strap on uh, the thigh plate itself. Okay? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and put the second piece on. Now, as you look at these pieces, you'll notice also that there's these little raised ridges here. Okay, it's got a rolled lip. So we call those things stop ribs. And a little bit later, about 10 years after this armor, we started to be putting a piece right on here that's a raised metal lip to catch something. What's its purpose? The idea behind plate armor is to make things slide. It's not to just soak an impact. Some pieces of armor have no choice but to do that. But you want to, as much as possible, make the blow slide off of you. So, that also means, though, there's the danger of something that hits and slides up. So the idea behind stop ribs are to catch and prevent a point from going any further. We'll see this a lot more clearly when we look at the breastplate. Now, I don't know anybody who's uh, watching out there or what your interests are, but we always usually have a few gamers in the crowd. So you'll watch how long it takes us to put this on as well as the fact that probably two of us at certain points are necessary to put it on. And you now have your answer how fast you can take your armor on or off if you need it. The answer, not fast. You'll also realize why you can't move silently. So. Now, once those legs are on, right, she has her basic protection from the mid-thigh down. Notice her hips. That's still just Aaron in there, okay? And her groin is completely open. These don't come all the way up to the top of the leg, because if they do, she can't move. She can't pull her leg up. She can't sit on a horse. She can't roll if she falls down. So it has to be cut low. But of course, there's a bunch of arteries and stuff in here that you really need. So this is where we need a flexible armor to make up for that. And this is called the male shirt, okay? So, um, the term is in this period is hauberchon, which means a shorter cloth bear, which is the name for a male coat. Okay. This is probably the single heaviest piece of armor. And for Aaron, this is probably about 15 pounds, I'm guessing. Mine's about 20. So now you'll notice she needs help. This is the hardest piece of armor to put on, not least of which because you don't want to rip your own hair off. Okay, so, and he likes to turn in on itself. Now, each of these links is riveted shut. So I want you to think about that. There's probably somewhere around 8,000 links in the shirt. Could be even as many as 10. And each of them is four links passing through one more, and they've been riveted shut. Later on, they figure out how to stamp some of them, so if they're a solid link with four riveted rings, but that only removes, you know, 20% of them later. There were entire villages that were basically designed to make you nail. Because it's not difficult, but it's tedious. So this is the oldest armor, predates the plate armor, and becomes a necessary part with the plate armor. So now you can see it comes down lower than the open areas, so it's overlapping. You can also see these little dags, these triangles. So let's ask, what are those for? To look cool. Because if you are going to wear the equivalent of a Corvette, you want to look cool, right? So it is purely blank. The dags do nothing else. They're just a way to decorate the armor. Uh, you'll notice that the sleeves are only half sleeves. That's because she has plate arm defenses, which we're gonna look at next. Yeah. So at this point, we can put a helmet and armor, uh, excuse me, a helmet and gauntlets on there. And she would be armed like a really well-to-do foot soldier. Okay. Say for example, someone using a halberd in group combat. Now what we're doing, in case you're wondering why we're fussing with her sleeves, is Aaron on the other hand has the knight's suit of armor. 
she has more armor to put on. The trick is those army points on her jacket, yeah, they have to get through the mail. And that can be an adventure all by itself. So now, we're going to take a look at your armor. And I'm going to just bring one close. What I want you to see again is you can see these raised lips, right? And the articulations, okay? Again, you can see that the buckles go on the inside. And then, again, this little bit here to protect the elbow, it could be done a variety of ways. That shaping is primarily decorative, but when you look, you can see how it's starting to curve in to protect the inside of the elbow. In about 60 years, there'll be a little extension that comes across here to completely protect the inside of the elbow, okay? But not in our period. And then again, there's leather, a leather strap with holes, where we're gonna go ahead and put a few laces. So the fussing is again because the stuff has to fit close to the body, but it has to fit close to the body with its arming clothes on, right? So, you know, when you take yeah, you take measurements for this armor, you have to have that's the other reason you have to start with your arming clothes. You have to have the right thing you're putting on. I get asked, do you wear a lot of padding underneath this? No, and increasingly less. In the age of male, they have a thick padded coat called Nakaton or a gamison that you may have heard it called. Um, but by this period, the army coat is either unpadded or might just have a little bit of padding in the hips, or a little bit of padding in the arms, places where the, you're not really wearing a lot of armor, and so where it can kind of rub the body raw. But if the armor is well made, it doesn't really go anywhere. So you just need some few layers of strong fabric, you don't need a lot of padding. For example, you can see, once I get the arm harness on, pointed the elbow is. Right? Obviously, that is a Darren's elbow. So that's all air. So it's not rubbing against her actual elbow. You probably also see that from wearing this nail. We start getting really filthy because the mail has to be kept boiled. So here's your fun fact for the night, or one of your fun facts I hope to give you tonight. Mail is made out of steel, but really most mail isn't even steel by medieval standards, it's iron. Because if it's soft, you grab the other arm If the mail is soft, it will deform and twist. Whereas if it's hard, like people ask me, could you make it out of titanium? You could, but it will crack. So you want this male to be flexible so that it twists and the links to form instead of just falling apart. But iron rusts just as easily as steel does, so you have to keep it clean. So first thing is you keep it oiled. Second thing is, if it does rust, what do you do? In the Middle Ages, what you do is you get your squires, and you give them a really great medicine ball workout. Because you take your male shirt, you throw it in a sack, you fill that sack with sand, you tie it off, and you make them play catch so that the sand abrades the rust off of the male. If you've got to do a bunch of shirts at once, you put them in a barrel, you, roll it, you fill it up with sand, and you roll the barrel back and forth. So this is actual physical training that was done for squires and pages to build strength. And let's face it, um, I'm sure, like any kind of hazing, Every knight who has gone through that himself is perfectly content to return the favor to the punky 13 year old kid who they now had with him for them. So, that's the other question uh, I get asked is so, when does someone start training for this? Tricky question. A page usually goes into service at a lord's home around 9 or 10. Uh, they're probably not doing a lot of combat training, probably a little bit. Mostly they're learning about what they like, they're learning how to ride, they're learning how to take care of horses. They are certainly doing some physical conditioning, but 
but seems to be that right around 14 years old is when the real training began. And most knights were considered adults around 18 years old, 18 to 21 when they were knighted. Now, the pieces that are going on now are called spalders or pauldrons. Um, when it's relatively small, just covering the shoulder, it's called a spalder. And when it's larger, so it comes down partly over to the chest, sometimes worn on the left side, it's called a pauldron. Uh, sometimes, some arrows, it's also called a pauldron when it's, it's one whole piece. Uh, something else that you should learn is that you get interested in this. People can be very pedantic about armor terminology. The truth is that they use their terminology a lot more fluidly than we do. And what something is called in Northern England in 1380 may not be the same as, quite the same as Southern England, let alone Northern France. And what it's called in 1380 may not be exactly the same thing as what it's called in 1480, even though the pieces are more or less the same. Now, there's several ways that this can be done. The English, for example, used to like to make this whole thing one big armor harness going on like a sleeve. Pros and cons. Pro, arm is better protected. There's no way for the strap to get broken and for your arm to come loose uh, inside of it. That's pro. Con, the more you link pieces together, the less dexterous it is. So, which one's better? really depends on the combatants. Like I said, the English and to some extent the French seem to prefer wearing it as all one piece of linked armor. The Italians and the Germans, uh, Central Europeans, and this is a Northern Italian, South German style harness, uh, prefer to have it in multiple pieces like you see here. Also, that's because sometimes, especially for things like skirmishing, um, you don't want all of your harness on, right? You siege, you might not want to wear all of that and trade a little protection for mobility. Very popular, for example, I think it's in the home. Very popular sometimes you just leave the right spaller off and just use the left with a little small shield. Now, this next piece that we're going to put iron is called a standard. Standard is of just a male collar. Right? That is put on a padded, a thick quilted padded liner. So I mentioned the Gambeson or Akaton. Here's kind of the last carryover of that, which is the standard. So it's completely padded, the male is laced to it. It often, you'll notice, has a tighter weave in the throat so that it's pr protecting you against anything that will slide up and try to get in under the helmet. It is also one of the least comfortable pieces of armor. Yes. Yeah, you know, you hear the unhappy moan when she says that. And um, absolutely one of the least uh, pleasant pieces of armor to wear. Um, one of the most important, and also one of the fussiest to put on by yourself. So most of your armor, like if Erin had to, she could scramble and take her arm harness by herself, probably. Shoulders would probably be very difficult. The legs she can certainly put on by herself. She probably get her mail with a little wiggling like a fish out of water. Um, but this thing, you're not going to fumble back there again. Just kind of and then this is the other thing that won't go on there. This is the breastplate. Okay. Now again, you can see the big raised stop rib, and I'll explain how all that works in a moment. Uh, this big center ridge is so that anything that hits straight on will deflect one way or the other. So as we get this on her, we we'll start showing you how that will all work. Now, Eric is wearing a simple breastplate. This is a little bit, considering the later date of her harness, this is a slightly simpler style. By this time, there is a full, what we would call a kaross, which means it's a breastplate with a series of hooped metal skirts protecting the groin. And even at this point, we're starting to see a steel backplate as well. Um, she doesn't wear one of those, and it isn't that there is a right or wrong. Both remained in use in this time period, and just like everything else, it all depends on what you're doing. 
Are you going to be sitting on a horse where someone's coming at you with a lance? You probably want to have that fall on. Okay, that's what the hoop skirt is called, to fall on. Are you going to be doing foot combat? It definitely slows you down and it's bulkier, so you might choose not to wear it. Do, you know, what are you going to be doing? Are you expecting to deal with a lot of arrows? Uh, arrows shot from a crossbow to punch through mail. So you might want more plate. Otherwise, you might never get close enough to fight them. That's probably something I should bring up, especially since Tony, uh, our host, is an archer, a uh, uh, historical archer. Okay. Is that there's a spot about arrows and what they can or can't do against armor. There's been some great examples of this. So the myth of the English longbow is that they just punched right through the armor of the French knights and they dropped them. Test after test after test shows that this just quite simply is not that isn't that isn't why the arrows were effective. It wasn't that you were target shooting. What was happening is that the sheer volley of these arrows were entangling the armor. They were creating massive percussive hits against the armor, against the helmet, causing blood force trauma inside the armor. Some would absolutely, a longbow certainly at the right range could penetrate mail. Okay. But that wasn't its principal purpose. And this was true even going back to, say, the era of the Crusades. We know that the um, Muslim hornbows were quite powerful, but that the Crusaders with their padding underneath there, we have whole accounts from Muslim combatants that they um, would shoot at the Franks, shoot at the Franks, shoot at the Franks, and they would say that, you know, they looked like porcupines riding towards us with the arrows sticking out of the mail, and they were just brushing them off. So mail over padding or plate over mail is very resistant to arrows until you get to things like powerful crossbows or obviously firearms. So that's why I, I get asked this a lot when we do these lectures. Well, if the crossbow is slow, why use a crossbow instead of a bow? So two reasons. One, you can teach people to use a crossbow much more quickly than you can make a competent archer. Two, it packs an incredible amount of punch and it can neutralize an armored combatant more readily until you get to things like uh, the longbow. Talking obviously about European weapons. Okay, so Erin now is in armor, right? She has two things left, her gauntlets and her helmet. So let's talk about the helmet. So this helmet style is called a bassinet. Um, it has this tall peak. It's kind of what we think of as the cone head helmet, right? It came into use from a little steel cap that people wore under the old great helm and then became a helmet in its own right because it just got longer. And they realized they could make this close fitting helmet, which gave you more mobility in your head. It fit closer, it was less cumbersome. It had these sloped surfaces, which you'll see when it goes on her head that'll deflect things, but it didn't have, a, it didn't have anything over the face. So that come up with something to put on the face. And this is where we get the first visor. Now the helmet has a padded liner inside of it, much like what you saw in the standard. It's dark color, I don't think it'll show very well on the camera. So I'm just gonna let Aaron put it on. Oh, remember what I said about the link? You can see the brass here, right? The brass is only purpose is to look pretty. Let me turn into the camera. Um, often knights have a family motto. And so in this case, often their motto is engraved right onto the brass. And Aaron, yours says? Um, Alice Bola Propri. Which means? Uh, she flies with her own wings. So there you go. So that's Aaron's personal motto. The helmet is probably the single heaviest piece. Um, the bassinet is one of the heavier styles of helmet. They actually get a little bit lighter in some cases. Uh, the later periods, other than the jousting helmet. And we're probably, the helmet itself is probably sitting in the 6 to 8 pound range. And then she has the male that's more. So it's a Yeah, I fly away. Yeah, so you're that. So with everything, the male, everything, that's 12 pounds of weight on her head. Okay? So you can see now, the male is coming in over the shoulder. So let's talk about, start talking about what we've got. So the visor comes down, and this is what we call a whose in German or a pink face in English, right? That's the name. So it's got this long snout. What's the snout for? 
So the reason for the snout is so that if something comes in like an arrow or a lance, it will hit and divert one way or the other, right? If it comes up, it will hit this long, tall crest and move up and away from her head. Again, Aaron is not a cone head. Her skull is way down here. So all of this, think of it like a crumple zone on a car. And it's a crumple zone on your head. So everything is meant to direct out and off to either side. Now what I want to show you is you can see there's all these holes here in the helmet. That's how she breathes. Okay, that and this tiny little mouth. So there's a little steel mouth. I'm going to maybe walk in a little closer. Right? And you can see there's this mouth here. It's flared so that it's hard to get an edge in there. Now if you look, there's the breaths. We only have seven holes here. Why? Why not cover them? And there are a few that survive that have holes everywhere. So the reason is most people are right-handed, right? This is you're on a horse, you're jousting, or more to the point, you're in war with a lance coming in. You do not want that lance tip to have all of these holes to catch, lodge in, and rip your head back and over your shoulder and either throw you out of your horse or break your neck. So the breaths go on the protected side, protected meaning that that's not the side the lance is coming up. So sometimes there's just a few holes like this, sometimes there's almost nothing, just a little mouth. Downside, we also use these little holes to see what the heck is going on. You may notice that Aaron's eye slots are very narrow. I right, to try to reduce the chance of a sword coming in. So let's talk about that. She and I are gonna walk back here. And Aaron, how much of me can you see? She can see my face, okay? How much of you can you see now? What me can you see now? I mean, I can see, I can see your face through my, my eyeball, and then a little bit of the torso. So with looking through the breast, she can see a little bit of my torso. Okay, how about now? I can finally see your feet. Okay, she can now finally see my feet. The problem is we're already inside the combat range, and a lot of that combat will occur here, which means that with the visor on, she can't see it, she has to feel it. So she's basically using the force to get through this fight, right? Okay, now, we'll talk about that when we look at how we defeat you. The last piece of the gauntlets, they are literally steel gloves with these raised little knuckles, which in and of themselves are weapons. Fun fact, some of the surviving gadlings, that's what the knuckle plates are called, um, that we have. Have, are covered in traces of blood when they've been analyzed in museums. So either just from being used or from being used themselves as a brass knuckle. Because you know, this is about a pound of steel on the end of your hand, right? The gloves are stitched in. It makes it a pain in the butt to replace. It also makes them far more protective of your hand so that they don't move. Okay. And again, it has the decorative brass work with the same model. All right, and of course, a knight is nothing without a sword. So, we will give Aaron one of those. Okay. All right, so now she's ready to rock, right? We have the fully armored knight. Now, if you can turn the face the camera. So, this is a knightly combatant, let's say the year 1400. Okay, like I said, we went from this to this. Now, she could have a few extra pieces on, like I mentioned, but basically from head to toe, she is covered in armor. Let's talk about what that means for combatants. And let's talk about, first of all, the armor tries to make up for areas where she's weak. So anywhere there's mail, she's vulnerable. She's not really vulnerable to sword cuts very much. Male armor is incredibly good at stopping sword cuts. Like I said, it twists, it deforms, and especially if there is any padding, you're really going to have a hard time cutting through. But what it is vulnerable to is thrusts. And some of these weapons of this era, it's not just a flat point, it's a triangular point, it's a, um, a rectangular point, reinforced, punched through the mail. So unfortunately, though, there's just some areas where to be able to move, you have to have mail. So what we do is we double it up. So for example, right, the male shirt with the breastplate, she needs to leave this part of her armpit open so that she can move her arm. 
Because this breastplate comes all the way over that crease, and she can't fight. So the helmet adds that piece of mail over here, so that now there's two layers of mail. And this one is free floating, so that as things hit, they may get caught and push up and tangled in the mail. And she can just knock it aside and keep fighting. Okay? So that's one way to protect it. The throat is one of the few spots on the human body where damage to it can end fight almost instantaneously. So if Erin looks up with her head, right, to get to her throat, anything that comes up, first of all, has to clear that stop rib or miss it. So let's just pretend I miss it completely. I miss the breastplate. I'm going to hit this male, which is loose. That will help take some of the actual percussive force out of it. I then will hit that standard, which is more tightly woven male over a thick layer of padding. And then I would have to punch through all of that before I can get to her throat. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't knock the wind out of her, that she won't be gagging, that I might not crush her throat. But it sure makes it a lot harder to get in and hit that, especially with something that just glances off of somewhere else to her throat. Okay? And again, the male you over here. Again, the male also comes down into the sleeve to help protect the inside of the arm. And then across the back of her leg, the reason we don't see, you'll see that the thigh plate comes part way, but not all the way. This is a, this is a knight's harness. She has to sit on a horse. If she completely encloses this in steel, she can't feel the horse underneath her. She can't signal the horse what to do with her legs. So the male has to help accommodate that. Okay. Now, what that means is that if you're going to fight Aaron, you have to know what you're fighting against. And this is where... It all gets very interesting. So, just okay. Aaron's going to take one for the team. This is her least favorite part of the armor demo. But I have to understand that armor works. Loud, right? Aaron, are you okay? Yep. It's loud in there, right? Yep. Did it hurt? Nope. Didn't hurt. Okay. So, the simple truth is that. The single biggest thing that armor rends almost useless is the sword. Crazy, right? Because it's an edged weapon, and edged weapons don't cut through plate armor until we get to really big edged weapons, of which I'll show you some. So that's the next myth about knightly combat once we're to the age of plate armor. This is to knightly combat is as a pistol is to modern warfare. It's a backup weapon that lives on your hip. Aaron's principal weapon is polearm. Okay? Or her sword, for dealing with people who aren't wearing all that armor, like say me. Because when I have to square off with her, just pretend that I'm not wearing my silk duds and that I'm wearing, you know, a soldier's padded coat, etc. Let's look at what I'm facing. So I could maybe hit her in the leg, except that, that won't do anything, right? I could maybe hit her in the arm, except that won't do anything. I could hit her in the head, except that won't do anything. She could cut me anywhere, and that'll kill me. All right, so that's a problem. So maybe I should just get close and try to wrestle her so she can't swing the sword. All right, well, she's wearing steel knuckles instead of brass knuckles. So if she punches me with that, I'm pretty much screwed. I could try to grapple her, except that she has these sharp wings that if she squeezes her arm shut, could easily take a finger off. She has the same thing if I screw her to a light pit. And of course, she can throw an elbow with one of these things up to my jaw, right? And I don't even want to think about the headbutt. So wrestling her isn't very useful either. So what's a man to do? Well, the first thing I have to realize is that I have to go where the armor isn't. And that's going to be true even if two knights fight each other. So what's that mean? What's, where's the armor not? It means that I have to use this end. And I have to look for the gaps. So in this case, the gaps would be the armpits, right? Yes, she's got a double layer of mail, but that sure beats a piece of steel. So I could thrust her into the armpits. I could thrust her into the elbow. In fact, there's a whole piece here where there's nothing. That's going to be hard to hit with a cut, a precision cut, but it's possible. I could certainly stick the point in there, right? I can come in under the armpit, and if I get through there, there's no ribs or anything in the way. That'll go right through her. I can thrust 
into the top of her thighs. Because she left the fall off to move better, her lower abdomen and her groin is available. The breastplate ends, by the way, just below the diaphragm. Can't go lower when you bend, you cut your own wind off. You have to have articulations. So she's just wearing the breastplate. I know that the abdomen is available. Okay. I'm starting to run out of options, guys. I can hopefully get behind her, and now she's wearing just male everywhere. So I can go looking for almost anything. Now, by almost anything, I don't want to get too gross about this, but, but first of all, I can come in right under the base of the helmet into the root, into her brainstem. Okay, this is one of the targets recommended for night vision beds. Or, I hate to say it, but yeah, yeah, right in the butt. And I don't mean in the butt cheek. Okay, there's a lot of arteries there, and unfortunately, more than one famous uh, nightly combatant can die from thrusts to the fundaments, as they like to say. Also, there are thrusts to the back of the knee back there, right? Because the back of the legs are open. And then finally, the one other thing that I can hit is I can hit her hands. The gauntlets themselves are pretty resistant, but honestly, enough cuts out of that thumb, that small steel over small bones. If I have to, I could break the fingers. But certainly, boom, thrusts into the palm of the hand are possible. Now, let's talk about the weapons that a guy like me is going to need to use to beat her. And then we'll talk about the two knights who aren't using those weapons, who actually do draw their swords square off. And I think we'll open it up to questions. Okay? So, the big thing to understand is that you don't Try to fight a knight with any pole weapon. You use a pole arm. I don't have my crossbow handy. I don't have a gun handy. I don't have 20 of my best friends handy. So I use something like this. This is an antique from our collection from around the year 1550. It's a winged spear called a spiedo. Um, you can see that, or you may not be able to see, but it is sharp all along the edges here. Okay. It has these little notches, which are meant to hook other pole arms and pull them back to free it up. But this can be used to catch weapons. So if you know, Aaron has her sword, if she can cut me, I can use that to catch her weapon and just place it and then thrust. I can even use this to catch her in there. Right? Catch her arm, catch her, sh her shin, and displace her. But most importantly, oh look, as soon as I put it up on camera, I have to walk all the way back here before you can see it. This boy is seven some feet long. So this gives me the ability to try to keep her at distance. And this very brutal point, this kind of chisel point, right, is going to be designed to punch through that nail. And once it goes through, to make one heck of a big wound. It has a reinforced cross section and it's designed to cause more damage. Okay? So this is just an evolution of the old spear specifically designed to deal with armored combatants. Uh, but you can become even more horrible to each other. And this is the weapon, essentially the counter knight weapon par excellence. It's called a polex. And it is the Swiss army knife of weapons. So it has a spike on top, which you can see is rectangular meant to make a hole that you can't close. It has an axe blade. A lot of them don't. They just have what looks like a three-toothed war hammer head. But it has an axe blade, not particularly sharp, vertical. So it just delivers a hard hit, not a slice, but just a hard hit. And then it has a back end that looks like, well, a meat tenderizer, because it is, okay? So the idea behind, now this one doesn't have anything here, but some of them would also have a spike on the back end. So the idea here is that this is essentially a weapon for bashing through this can, and it's like turning Aaron into a can ham. This is going to open it up so I can get to all the pink, soft, cushy stuff on the inside. Right? I can thrust through those openings. I can deliver an incredibly hard blow that can probably pierce the nail through just sheer crushing force. I can hook her and try to pull her off her feet. Okay. I can do any of those things. Boom. There's the hammer. And 
Again, it has length. Of course, there's a problem, which is that sometimes knights have a full axe. So if I'm not a knight, what do I do with that? Um, hopefully, either I run, or she sees that I'm wearing really nice clothes, and I surrender for ransom. Because knightly combat is often about taking the people of rank for ransom. So I look pretty good. I might get through this, right? Uh, you know, my schlub uh, archer Guido may not. And now he has to face all that where his side three less. So the poleaxe is a unique weapon because it's the one form that was really designed for knightly combatants to fight on foot against other knightly combatants. Next fun fact. That's considered a weapon that you also fight in a tournament or sport with. So we'll both have one of those and, you know, we'll fight to three, five, seven, 25 blows, right? Uh, for the entertainment of lords to see uh, who comes out on top. It's unclear if that was always using sharp weapons. It seems not to have been, but even so, you know, you're talking about four pounds of steel on the end of a five foot long stick. You can do an incredible amount of damage. Oh, did I mention the spikes on the side? So even if you try to grab this, it'll probably impale your hands. Told you, it's the Swiss Army knife with weapons. All right. So now let's pretend that I'm wearing my armor too. Show the ladies. So it's come to swords. Whether this is on a battlefield, and we've gotten unhorsed, or we've dismounted, or we started on foot, or whether it's in some sort of a uh, trial by combat, whatever it is, but we're forced to fight in lethal combat with swords and we're both in armor. I just showed you that cuts don't work. I just told you that that's what you see in movies and run fairs at the start, but now you know nothing happens. So what do you do? You have to use the point. So what you need to do with the point is you need to use the sword, not the spear. So one of the things we do is we simply grab the blade and make the sword into a spear. And this is called fighting with the shortened point, or sometimes also known as half sorting, depending on the tradition. So the idea here is that Aaron and I are going to adopt a series of guards, just like we do would in normal combat, that turns us into a spear. And some of them are offensive and some of them are defensive. So since she's a better armor, we'll make her offensive. And so the first guard we have is called the short serpent, right? Because she's basically just going to use it like a bayonet. And this is the serpent's tongue flicking out to hit me. These names always tell you kind of what it does. So let's put here, there, uh, turn about 45. Turn towards me. That's what you can see a little better. And so if I see that, I want to set up into a defensive guard. So a defensive guard might be, for example, called a true cross, because no matter where she thrusts it's inside my sword, and I can put that aside and close in and thrust into one of the openings in her armor. Okay? So now, of course, that's a great idea, but just like any fencing, I'll show that one more time. She taps, I put that aside, and in I go, right? Wow, that was easy, and she's dead. Okay, but just like any fencing, that could be a feint, and when I go to hit that, she disengages and comes around with her hilt. Now I just ate a pommel, and I'm going to probably eat the pommel again, right? So that's one possibility. Is she just uses full ends. Another is just, remember, it's a serpent. The tongue flicks and pulls back in and flicks out again. She could faint, and when I swing, oh, look at that. And now I'm dead. So you'll notice the scary thing is that the measure is very close. Now, obviously, it's also true that she gives me a thrust like that, right? I might miss, it might scrape off. At which point, we're moving into grappling range because my sword is trapped in her nail. So I might have to try to get free and get it in again. Okay? We don't, it's a very close fight. It's not out here. It's wrestling with the swords in a sense. Yet there's still a fencing component that you have to get past the point. So she may decide to threaten me with another offensive guard, where she lifts it high to show me what she's intending. This is called the high serpent. Okay? Now this is a little bit harder, because if I try to make that same parry, 
She might come down over the top. She might use that to wrench my sword for you. So it's not quite as easy. You see how she's just putting me into a wrist lock? Right, with one little turn. Our big thing for that spreading the needle. On the other hand, I might decide to take an offensive guard too. And there's that thrust right into the gauntlet I told you about. She has to expose the hand to take that guard. So everything becomes a, a chess match of safety versus um, uh, versatility in combat is what we're looking for. So as we move around, looking through these openings, you see how now she's keeping that hand covered, right? I might be thankful for that. She's trying to come in over the top. Again, this is wrestling, assuming I have armor. I can push that aside. I'm like, God, they keep grabbing the blades, pushing the blades. So I want you to remember this. These are not lightsabers. In fact, other than about the last six inches, they're not even razor sharp. They're sharp. They're sharp like an axe is sharp, right? But they're not really sharpened all the way razor sharp. Some swords were or seem to have been allowed what we have and survive. The edges have been damaged over the years or just allowed to dull. But they were probably not kept particularly sharp. And the ones designed for armored combat were specifically told are only sharp from the last few inches of the blade for just this reason, so I can grip it. Now, there's also the possibility that when she wants to come in at me, right? I could throw this one handed like I would a spear. This is another guard called the Sagittaria guard, right? For Sagittarius and Archer. It's a Latin term for an archer. So the idea is that I'm going to fling the point, either holding on to it or even just throwing it like a javelin, possibly to close with another weapon, which we'll show you in a moment. Okay. So these are the guards from the sword. Yeah, now you'll notice how Aaron just dropped her point into a two-handed guard. This is a thrusting guard called the middle iron gate. It's called that because anything that I throw above her, she can parry with her false edge, right? If I were to cut. But what makes it really dangerous, and obviously the middle because it's in the center line, what makes it really dangerous is that remember what we said about visors? I'm talking to you in civilian clothes. I can see that. Erin, can you see the sword? No way. She can't see it. So she can't see that thrust into the groin or that thrust up under the, throat, the visor into the throat. It's just not possible to see these actions. So if she adopts that and I'm in armor, right? That Vera Croce guard suddenly is very scary. So I may bring my blade forward into a guard called the Bastard Cross. Bastard because it's not quite as full of position. That's usually how they use the term in the Middle Ages. It means something that is neither one thing nor another. But this way, I at least have a barrier to try to flip up with that. Right? And if I do see it, I can put it aside and move in for the thrust. So what you can see is that sword fighting with two fully armored people isn't what you're thinking of. It's basically spear fighting and wrestling with a bayonet. All right? Now, what if Aaron is in armor and I'm not? Well, I have to do everything I just showed you. Okay? Everything I just showed you. If I can't run away. Aaron, on the other hand, can absolutely just use that to throw cuts. She doesn't need to close up anything. Right? So she could choke out those things. Right? She can choke up and rear back and throw as many cuts as she wants, which I still can't deal with. I can't soak that. So I have to deal with all of those cuts while trying to close with somebody who is basically a weapon on their entire body. Nice little quote from one of our fencing manuscripts where it says, if you find yourself a set upon by five, by five or more peasants, here's what you should do. And it gives a strategy for how to run and let chase you, string them out, run and then turn and cut one down and then keep running and turn and cut them down. And then at the end, it tells you that if, they're, if you're wearing your harness for war, just stand and cut them down as you go. Which tells you what they thought about the versatility of, and usefulness of armor. So, why don't you ever see actors doing this in movies? Well, because if it's Game of Thrones and you're paying Kit Harrington a couple of million a season, you're not paying him to wear that helmet and not show his face. And if everybody goes, oh, that's the stuntman, right? Everybody knows in The Mandalorian, it's the stuntman, while the actor is just a voice, okay? That's not what most films are paying for. They want to show this expensive star in the midst of combat because it creates a sense of drama. 
So what do actors always not wear in the film? A helmet. Or if they do wear it, as soon as it starts, they take it off. Now what is funny is these things are really hot and you really can't see. And so sometimes in close foot combat, his visor is held on by pins. Knights would actually remove the visor so that their face was exposed. And that obviously creates an immediate target. In fact, out of, even when they are wearing it, one of the targets we're advised to use is as you come up, it's just to push the visor up and thrust into the face. Okay, it's not secure, so you can lift it to breathe. And sure enough, starting all the way back, you know, with the 11th century and all the way through to the 16th, we have plenty of accounts of commanders lifting their visors to catch their breath and taking an arrow to the eye. That's by legend how King Harold died at um, the Battle of Hastings. Those helmets don't have visors, but he supposedly was simply pushing it back so he could see what was happening. He took an arrow to the eye. We have a number of commanders all through the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries who died because they exposed their face and they an arrow. So it's a huge liability, but you know what? So it's gassing out in the middle of the battle. So again, armor is about trade-offs. It's about protection versus versatility. So the last weapon of the knightly arsenal that we need to talk about, and it's probably the scariest. But what could be scarier than all that? It's the humble little dagger. The number of fighting masters from the 15th century tell us that this little weapon right here is the court of the cause of last resort, and that in single combat with two people in full armor, so for example, in judicial duel, it will always come to wrestling and the knife. So if you look at this dagger, you can see it has a single edge, the very broad spine, and a very, very, I'm trying to find the camera, very, very narrow reinforced tip. Okay? So I just showed you how close we will get to each other in armor. And what that means is that if we are going to fight past the sword, then the dagger is going to be this weapon of last resort. And that's why it lives right on the right hip. So if I start coming in, Aaron can immediately clear, draw that knife and apply it. And where does it go? So all those same places that you saw before. So here's what we've covered. We talked about the armor and how much it weighs. We talked about all the ways it goes on, right? Why it goes on the way it does. We talked about overlapping defenses. We talked about why you don't see any of this in movies. We've also talked about why once you have this sort of thing, the kind of weapons you need change. And then we've talked about when two people fight in armor, what that would look like. And why, obviously, as the unarmored guy, the biggest thing I want to do if I have to fight an armored opponent is get some freaking armor. All right, I hope you've enjoyed. We're pretty much at time. I will take a few questions if there are any. But if not, it's always a pleasure to come out. And I'd like to thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's Tony, the host. I'm just uh, popping in to basically corroborate all of everything you said about arrows. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, archery works because it's mass fire, but no archer wants to be stuck trying to target shoot someone in heavy armor coming at them, or yeah. there'd be no reason to wear heavy armor, right? So. Right, and yeah, people see like, you know, the, you know, the arrows. Of course, arrowheads are very important, but you know, it's that heavy draw. It's these guys are drawing like. 120 pound bows and like you said they're hitting with this concussive force and there's a lot of arrows coming at them so that's the only otherwise if it's just one guy it's not going to do anything against an armored opponent no but when it's you and 30 of your buddies peppering you with those and their bodkin points which are shaped like that Lundell dagger there's just these little you know square cross-section things slamming into me constantly into the head into the throat um Sooner or later, it's just causing massive repetitive concussive power. So, there's a great video online um, that was done recently by a, a guy named, uh, his company's called Todd Stuff. He does a lot of really high end replicas where they, they practice some shots shooting against 
plates and against you know various uh, replica fabric armors. Um, my wife actually is a, a historian for replica fabric armors of the late Middle Ages, and they used some of her ideas that some replicas made and shot it. And uh, and it, it's amazing. So what happens is when armor fails to an arrow, it fails basically spectacularly. Mm. But otherwise, yeah, it's it's you and a massive guy just peppering these people. Oh yeah. Try to wade through it. And if they can't, if you hold them up short, they're never getting through. Oh so. yeah. Um I was wondering if anyone in the group has any experience with uh, brigandine armor. I have a soft yeah. spot for that type of armor, actually. Yeah, we do. You know, brigandine armor is what the plate armor grows out of. Um, mm. And like everything else, pros and cons. Uh, the later 15th century brigandine armor is actually really comfortable. Lots of small plates so you can move around easily. Um, and pretty protective. The earlier stuff, like the, the Bisbee coats of plates, or the really yeah, big plates, scary. they are... They are not nearly as comfortable as this. Mm -hmm. They're much easier to produce. Oh. Um, so they do go to types of brigandine armor using many, many small overlapping plates uh, in the 15th century that is worn for either a lighter armor or worn by soldiers because it's very versatile. Again, does not take as much skill to make um, and it's fairly comfortable and very protective, very protective. So you throw that over males, it's extremely protective. The trick is that the bigger the plates and the less overlap, then the easier you're going to find a gap you can punch, say, that dagger through or that sword through, right? So to make it really work, you have to keep overlapping the plates. The more you overlap the plates, the more metal you're adding to the, to the thing. So, for example, a coat of plates and a cross, most of the time, the cross is lighter than the coat of plates. Wow. And so basically what happens is what was knightly armor becomes soldier's armor you know, the next generation. It, it's essentially becomes technological handy mounts, if that makes sense. Uh, I got a comment uh, here from the, some of the audience. So everyone's pretty much saying thank you for the presentation. Uh, so uh -huh. it's been super great. And our, our, our pleasure. I wish we were doing it live, but the world is what it is. Yeah. Uh, one of the comments is saying, uh, amazing how much weight she can handle. I guess assuming talking about the whole, you know, moving around in armor. Yes, well, and so the trick is basically, like I said, you'd be amazed what a human can, being can wear and carry and fight in, and this is distributed on her whole body. And that army coat we showed you, and in fact, Nicole, whose home we're using, is actually the person who makes it, and her company, her line of clothing, makes the fighting clothing that we wear. Um, that garment, the reason it has to be so fitted, so you can not only keep the armor from shifting, so that the weight stays distributed. And so it all becomes built around that, that one linen coat. But it changes everything. The other thing is that when you're wearing this armor, your stance just has to sit. So, mm. and you know, again, this gear I could ask, you know, so it's like off the rack, it, it's custom made. Um, plate armor, the, the higher status the armor, the more it is one size fits one. You know, a few people can swap out a helmet or gauntlets or whatnot, but like I showed you those greaves. Those are fitting Aaron's calves and nobody else. Mm. So mine are the same way. They, they, and frankly, if I spent like a summer hiking, my calves can outgrow them. And I know that because they have. Wow. Okay? Or if I kind of you know, slack in the winter and get my winter pudge and my, my legs get scrawny, they'll slide around on me in the spring. So they're, they're that close fitted. Mm. Uh, is there like a... I know because you said it was the armor is custom. Is there like a, a ballpark range of what this is uh, in current modern currency? Sure. So there's a lot of really good talented armors who work off of casts, molds of your body parts you send them in Eastern Europe, and that's brought the pricing down quite a bit. So my entire harness probably cost about eleven thousand dollars. Aaron, what was yours? About 55 or 60. About, hers was about 6,500. You could get a, you know, a pretty decent basic harness to start training in that wouldn't be like the armor you wanted to wear for the rest of your life, but would be suitable to learn to do this in for probably a few grand. Um, and yeah, and so my advice to people is don't buy a whole suit of armor right away. First, you start learning how to do this. You're learning how to wrestle. You're learning how to sword fight. Then you buy that army coat, right? Because you're going to need it. Then you buy a male shirt because those have come down in price quite a bit. Then you save your money for a really good pair of 
gauntlets and a helmet. And then you mm -hmm. might buy a cheap $100 breastplate just to get used to the weight that you're going to bequeath to somebody later. And then you decide, I like it. Well, now you start putting your money towards the good stuff. But there's ways to learn a lot of this stuff without, you don't just buy a suit of armor and go to it. you got to learn how to wear this stuff anyway. Um, I guarantee you, as soon as we are off camera, Erin will be taking this off as quickly as she can. So she and I, she and, she and I have traveled all over the country. We fell in Europe together. And I would, we, we are pretty used to wearing this stuff. And I can tell you that as soon as you can take it off, it's like, oh, that feels so good. You always brag. I'm so used to wearing it. I can sit around and share. I can drink. I can fight. I can walk. Sure, but as soon as it comes off, there's just this. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, I got uh, no other questions right now, so I think I think we might be okay to wrap up. All right, fantastic. Well, again, um, I'm really glad we could figure out a way to make this work. I'd like to thank again Nicole from Revive Clothing for letting us use her studio. Uh, it's just pretty darn cool and provides a great backdrop for doing this. I'd like to thank Aaron for volunteering to drive out to Aurora from the city and put all this stuff on on our school night. And um, obviously, Tony for saying, let's go ahead and do this anyway. So there is one last question that came up, Tony, when I did a, a sword, the medieval sword demo for you that someone asked. Oh, okay. Um, one of the kids asked, and I thought it'd be a good thing to talk about just to say goodnight. So we were asked, like, how did, you know, I talk about how do all these different weapons fight somebody in our Back up. So, so they can see the whole thing. Obviously, on the other hand, if you have a lightsaber, <laughs> by all means, the armor won't do anything. So I don't know who that young man was, but I'm glad he asked the question. Hopefully at some point he'll see this. So you'll know that I do indeed have an answer. The same answer for him I gave him a year ago. Only now with props. So on that note, oh Greg a long time ago through the 14th century to today. Thank you everybody and you all have a great night and stay safe. Oh Greg, sorry. Yeah. There's one one more that snuck in. One more question. Yeah. The, the spear, because you said the spear's from 1550. Yeah. What's, what's the, the background uh, on that? How did you come to have that? Um, there's, there's a number of, of antique dealers that, just like there's antique dealers that will sell you a bunch of your great grandmother's furniture that you don't know why anybody would want, or there's you know, antique china. There's antique weapons and there's antique weapon dealers. Um, uh, that came from a place called Fagan Arms and Armor in Michigan. And um, they, they, sell, you know, they sell everything from Bronze Age swords to African arms and armor to uh, medieval weapons. Most medieval swords, pole axes, are really out of most people's price range. Uh, one in good condition could be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. But pole arms, pole arms are actually kind of shockingly um, affordable. Um, you know, they can be one to two grand, in, you know, unless they're unless they're very elaborate or you know they know they came from like I see. Uh, royal royal armory or something. So yeah, so we've been slowly collecting a few historical pole arms for the studio, so we can. Put them in people's hands and show them that things really That's awesome. I think I'm pretty sure. I think we might be good for now. But All really, right. thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. All right.